podcast. Uh, I have two very exciting guests today. Again, support the podcast, support the quick thumb Amazon banner, check out this life. But now we get right to my guest. Uh, I have Patrick Krill. He is the director of the Hazelton Petty Ford Foundation Legal Professional Program. He's a licensed attorney, he's a board certified alcohol and drug counsel counselor, and he is interested uh, in the phenomenon of addiction in, in attorneys. I'm going to bring him in later, but now I want to welcome Ken Kratz. Ken, you may know Ken from the uh, Stephen Avery case. He has an upcoming book trilogy, Avery, Dassey, and Teresa. Three books coming out in fall of 2016. And uh, in that, Ken is detailing the Making a Murderer stories. Ken, I so appreciate you being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Dr. Drew, thanks for having me. So, shall we start with your story? I want you to kind of drive this, or the Making a Murderer story. I'll let you kind of, to whichever you feel most passionate you want to talk about first. Well, we, I certainly have, uh, have strong feelings uh, about both. With your upcoming guests, uh, why, don't we, why don't we launch right into the, um, you know, the difficulties, and not only with attorneys uh, generally, uh, but, uh, but my case uh, specifically how I uh, became uh, dependent on uh, prescription drugs and, and really uh, fueled a lot of other unhealthy behaviors that I involved myself in. What, what drugs did you end up strung out on? I was uh, 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 dependent on uh, Xanax and, uh, and Ambien and then uh, Vicodin. So that uh, particular um, cocktail, which I guess isn't, uh, isn't all that... Uh, isn't all that uncommon, you know, the the the, the benzodiazepine with the uh, with the uh, with the Ambien and then the uh, the, the opiate as well. Well, you're. Um, I will just say you're you're lucky. Obviously, you're lucky to be here. It's obviously, yeah, obviously dangerous, you know. Yeah. With, uh, Keith Ledger and, and and lots of others, you know, are, are really uh, famous for uh, for not doing quite as well. So, uh, but but what it uh, what it caused, and, and of course with. With my uh, the pressures that uh, uh, that I was under after the uh, the Avery case, uh, this all began. Uh, I would um, suspect as a result of uh, of the Avery case. You know, it was a, a case that I was uh, very much in the the public eye, very much in the limelight for uh, 18 straight months. You know, we were on the the front page and and uh, uh, really in a, a very very high profile case. And then and then it all stopped. You know, after after that all uh, went back to uh, to normal, if I can if I can use that term, I really struggled. I was having a, a really difficult uh, difficult time, and I had developed some real anxiety issues. And, then, and of course, uh, you know, prescribed uh, uh, Xanax and the sleeping issues with, with the Ambien, and and uh, it just uh, really got away from me to the to the point where I. Uh, I started needing those things uh, during during my day. I was still able to, I think, uh, perform my my job duties uh, pretty well. But uh, obviously, some of the other behaviors that uh, uh, that occurred uh, not not as a result of it, but certainly lowered inhibitions and, and other kinds of things where some of my other personality uh, uh, challenges uh, raised to the surface, uh, my, uh, my narcissism and, and some other things. Um, and so it really was a, 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 a convergence of, uh, uh, my personality with, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the use of the drugs that uh, led to really erratic and, and, uh, uh, deplorable, uh, behaviors. You know, it wasn't until, uh, after, uh, treatment, I, I, uh, I was uh, uh, after this whole thing kind of blew up. I, I, um, I became suicidal. Uh, actually, put a gun in my mouth um, uh, and was really, uh, really having a hard time with um, with having kind of gone from very well respected and and um, obviously uh, uh, very into uh, into my job to. Uh, to really vilified within maybe a, a 48 or 72 hour period. And so uh, I was lucky enough to have a, a psychologist friend uh, who, uh, uh, who called uh, a general path down in, uh, down in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi and, and uh, got into uh, the Dr. Carnes program. And, and of course uh, 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 with the, uh, uh, 
the, the sexual um, uh, acting out and uh, the combination of the, uh, the the drugs. I was uh, I was really in a in a, in a dark place, and I'm, I'm really fortunate to have uh, come out uh, on uh, the other side. You know, after five and a half years of uh, of sobriety from um, from prescription uh, drugs. Uh, uh, at all, uh, my involvement in uh, uh, NA and and uh, SAA and and other uh, other kinds of things. I'm really fortunate uh, now, uh, as a defense attorney and and just as a person in recovery, to be able to to help people that uh, struggle with their addiction issues. Okay, I've got, I want to unpack all that because a lot there, including I'm yeah, so, there is a lot yeah, there, including. Right? Let me just start with you're a defense attorney now. That's a switch. Yeah, yeah, well, it is, but it, it you know not a whole lot different uh, as far as reviewing the case. You know, when I was a prosecutor, uh, I was very much able to look at a referral that would come to me, at a case that would come to me as a defense attorney. You know, you look for the weaknesses right away. You look for the, the holes in the case. You look for uh, what are the possible defenses. And, of course, uh, now you do the uh, exact same thing, only um, it's to exploit those um, uh, those uh, defenses rather than to, you know, shore them up uh, with additional investigation or, or the prosecution uh, ways. So it is a uh, it, it is a change, but uh, I know that you've had uh, uh, lots of guests and you've had lots of panelists and things that have have made the switch very very um, seamlessly, and it, it really isn't as hard as uh, it always. It always surprises me. It, it always it always shocks me when I hear it. But the, but I know that you guys make great. Defense defense attorneys afterwards let's go back to the medication because are you i i blame my profession for so much of uh, stories like yours i've seen a million of them most of them don't survive because that uh, that combo of benzo and opiate is a fatal combination frequently as you mentioned heath ledger are you angry with your doctor for having prescribed this stuff and kept you on it without any sort of real supervision or warnings i don't think so and 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 again my um uh, my Xanax use uh, specifically wasn't wasn't really that much over the top. You know, I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, using any more than maybe two milligrams a day. But hey, Ken, so, Ken, let me stop yeah. you. If I had a patient on two two, millions, two milligrams a day for more than a week, I'd have you airlifted. <laughs> I would I would call every pharmacy in town. That is a big dose of Xanax to be on for a sustained period of time. And I know you're having a lot of things. Yeah. Part of it is you start having withdrawal after about a week or so. So your panic starts right. getting worse. You start shortening the intervals of dosing, and off you go. Right. And, I, you know, the, the prescription was for one. And then, you know, I, I was self-medicating. And stuff but like they same, should but have been they, all over that. They should yeah. have, that should have yeah, been yeah. all over and then yeah, Adam, and I, and go ahead. That, that's right. I'm not, uh, but I don't. You know, I'm. I'm never the type that that's gonna uh, that's gonna blame others or, or, or things like that. But it is a, it is a dialogue that uh, that that's got to be had more than more than it even even has. I understand that that your profession's uh, really looking at that really hard. And same thing with the same thing with same thing with you know Viking and, and the other uh, yes. the Europa is, is as well. I mean they're just yes. handed, they're handed out like candy so much and and of course that. That combo, you know, when you add uh, when you add Vicodin to the Ambien and the and the Xanax, well, you know, it's Katie bar the door. So that's right. That's, uh, that's how that turns out. And so, what happened to you behaviorally? So now you you're strung out. You're you're not yourself, and you're looking. You're getting probably depressed and desperate, and you don't really know what's happening to you. What happens? Well, I was having some some uh, some marital issues uh, as well, and it became a situational thing. You know, when I say that um, um, that it was like uh, uh, um, the inhibitions just just seemed to to, to to melt away. And when I was talking about um, sexual um, acting out, uh, you know, it, it manifests itself in uh, extramarital affairs and and um, and. Uh, um, uh, hitting on uh, uh, women uh, eventually within my uh, profession, within my professional world, um, that uh, again looking back is is absolutely deplorable. You know, the crime victims, and I don't know if you if you realize, but in Wisconsin, I was the the chairman of the Crime Victims Rights Board, and so crime victims for twelve years was kind of my 
thing. I helped uh, draft the legislation for crime victims' rights. And yeah. so uh, to have eventually, you know, I got involved in this texting uh, situation with a, with a crime victim to have identified a crime victim as uh, somebody that, you know, someday I'd like to develop a, a relationship with. You know, it doesn't, doesn't get much worse than that. When you look back on those kind of things, you just say, uh, what the hell were you thinking? I mean, there's just no, there's, there's, there's no path to any kind of good decision making or, or upside to that. And, and you really, as far as, you know, you, you, you hear the term, of course, uh, I don't know if you, if you, uh, uh, subscribe to this, but your brain is really hijacked. Yeah. You really yeah, have 100%. no opportunity to, uh, to make any, any, uh, meaningful, uh, uh, decisions, at least with the, you know, with the, with the front part of your brain yeah. where you're supposed to be making them and, and you're making them with, the uh, with your pleasure center with the middle part and, and you know where that's going to lead and it's just it's it's never a good situation and and attorneys are particularly difficult and resistant to get into treatment did, did it take a bit to get you to sort of really look at things well it 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 took it took me losing everything dr drew i mean it was as as i mentioned um i was able uh, to kind of keep the plates spinning in all my different lives uh, pretty well. You know, we're, we as attorneys, I think, are pretty uh, pretty good at multitasking, and, and especially when, uh, when you have a, a relatively uh, powerful uh, position as, as district attorney. You know, there aren't too many people that are going to call you on things, and so uh, that is a, a, a benefit, but when you're, when you're struggling with addiction issues, it's a real... It, it, it's a real detriment because when people are looking the other way, uh, they're certainly not doing you any, any favors by doing that. And, and I think uh, as it turned out, as my behavior became more and more erratic and, and more and more uh, risk-taking uh, behavior, um, it just got to the point where uh, there wasn't going to be a, a, a good ending to this. You know, I'm really fortunate to, to not have engaged in, in, in even worse behavior than than I did and uh the fact that I uh you know I lost I lost my career and 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 basically everything but uh I just uh best thing you've heard this I'm sure as well best thing that that ever happened to me was uh was my uh, having crashed from from that whole situation that craziness that uh, that was my life and when I kind of woke up in the middle of this uh, uh this firestorm that was around me and you ask yourself uh, what happened how did how did I get here uh was uh, was really life changing and how did you find treatment how was that for you well, uh, it was interesting, you know. That uh, uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the facility that I'm talking about. I am. I know. I know, really, pa- I know Patrick very, very well. Yeah, very, very intense uh, place. You know, there are only 22 uh, uh, individuals in, in in treatment, and you know, when you talk about um, um, hypersexuality or, or sex addiction or those kind of issues, um, it's such a uh, a secretive, uh, shame-filled kind of uh, kind of thing that uh, that 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 you engage yourself in. But the the, the people that were uh, in treatment uh, with me all had very very similar stories. All you know, physicians or CEOs are really high high functioning, very uh, uh, very high profile uh, jobs. I always joked about uh, about it. One of the uh, one of the, the the directors down there, uh, of course, they don't like to watch TV, which is which is fantastic because what was happening when I was in treatment for five weeks, you know, I was on the front page and there was a firestorm going on, and I really didn't know anything about it, which is again, I think, very fortunate that that they do that. But as I kind of came out of my fog, one of the directors said, uh, "Who are you, <laughs> and why are you on CNN? Why, why, why do we hear all these stories? You don't seem." You don't seem like you're all that important, really, because well, the other, the, the, the others that, uh, and of course, I won't, I won't uh, violate anything. But the, you know, I was the least well-known person that was in that group. You know, it was and interesting. So it was when, really a, a you remember, really uh, uh, interesting group of individuals. If you remember, I'm sure you do that. Uh, Tiger Woods went out of that program, and when he yeah. came out, he was talking like a recovering person. He was talking about his peers yeah. and being observant. I, I was like, "Oh my God, he's getting it!" And then he seemed to bail on the whole thing. He yeah. and, and then get, look what happened to his career. I mean, the good things happen when right. you find recovery. Let, right. let me. Let well, me, here's a, the, the, let me just, if I, if I can, because I'm really proud of this. After the 
after that particular um, a stint down there, um, there are about uh, eight or ten of us uh, uh, individuals that went through, you know, that same thing. And it's really, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's so much trauma, and you're coming yeah. through this together. You know, there's this bonding yeah. that goes on. We formed a, uh, a support group, a conference call, um, that for four years, every Saturday for an hour and a half, uh, we religiously... Uh, checked in with each other and Good. were able to continue uh, continue our our recovery program. You know, it just Wonderful. really starts and something like that, and you gotta you gotta move forward. But to be able to to really have uh, on a on a weekly basis to have assisted each other in in that process really was uh, was something that uh, that helped a lot as well. Thanks for letting me talk about that. Oh my God, it's fantastic! And did uh, Dr. Carnes use a circle plan back then? Uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, his wife was uh, was passing away at yeah. the time. I, you might remember, and that yeah. was that was back in the in the fall of 2010. And so he was absent much from mm-hmm. uh, from from the program. But they certainly had really high quality uh, uh, professionals that, uh, that 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 directed you. But it's such an intense. You, know, you go from you go from from. Uh, you know, being the, uh, the the big man on campus, to really just being another another blade of grass, you know, down down in that situation, and and uh, really really an interesting situation with 13 hours of treatment a day and and doing everything with the uh, with these guys, and of course it's uh, the ability to uh, to kind of patch yourself back uh, back together, and it really is just crisis management at that point. You know, six weeks isn't going to be enough to, right. uh, to to do very much. Other other than uh, kind of stem the, uh, the the tide of your of your behavior and, and give you the tools and and then it's up to you if you're going to take advantage of, of what you've learned or if you're going to kind of slip back uh, back into things like that. I was lucky enough to have come back and into the, the northeast uh, Wisconsin area. You know we had uh, we had. Uh, many, many SAA uh, programs, which is really uh, was really fortunate for for for, for that uh, that area of of the country to have um, you know that many people. And when I walked uh, into my my program uh, for the first time, uh, my home group then uh, back in uh, back in the Appleton, Wisconsin area, uh, and I recognized so many people, and it was just such a such an empowering moment, such a, a welcoming uh, a event to walk in like that and realize, you know what, um, I thought I was the only one that was involving myself in, in, in this kind of thing and, and uh, you know, suffering and isolation and, and all those uh, those behaviors and, and the shame cycle and then the whole thing is just, is just so, so, so terrible. But what's so great about it is, is when, uh, when you realize then it, uh, First of all, it's not just you. There's there's lots of people that suffer with the with the same thing, but that you don't have to suffer anymore in isolation. That there's people out there that are are designed to, to, to help you. And I know that you'll be you'll be talking to, to one of those. Uh, the Wisconsin uh, Lawyer Assistance Program is uh, is fantastic. And and even before I left General Path, uh, they made contact with me. They hooked me up with a uh, a sponsor with a, a peer, another lawyer who had gone through that even before I got back uh, to Wisconsin. And, and really, I've been very active ever since in helping other lawyers that are suffering with the various kinds of addictions here in Wisconsin. Ken, hold on one second. I'm going to bring in Patrick, who's been listening to your story. And Patrick, this is uh, you and I have spoken in the past about these kinds of stories and how tough it is for attorneys. Uh, Ken's story is actually kind of thrilling because he, he things went precisely the way you would hope and pray it would. They did. They did go exactly the way you would hope and pray they would. But after, as Ken mentioned, he he essentially lost everything. And Ken, let me just start by saying it's nice to make your acquaintance and congratulations on the the five and a half. Thanks very much, Hubbard. That's that's fantastic. Um, But it, it does sound like once you made the decision that you were going to reach out for help, you were fortunate enough. You had a friend who was a psychologist, and they were able they were able to get you somewhere. But um, so much of what I heard in your story just now is really consistent with the experience of a lot of attorneys and judges that I, that I work with from around the country, you know, starting from how the addiction takes hold. It's really sort of a form of 
self-medication to, to handle your anxiety and to deal with your anxiety. And then I think the way you put it was it just sort of slowly got away from you. And then, you know, the fact that people in your professional orbit were kind of turning the other way, or, you know, looking the other way, turning a blind eye, that's something that I see all the time as well. well and, I, would, I would think you, know, you, and I, you and I discussed this more, it's more active than turning a blind eye. It's a little bit of a, you know, boys will be boys, almost a, a, an endorsement of some of these behaviors. Well, no? there's that too, because heavy well, drinking is primarily the, you know, that's the substance of choice. Alcohol is the substance of choice primarily in the legal profession, but there, it is so, it is so normalized within the culture. And so not only is it a boys will be boys type attitude or atmosphere, there's also a little bit of a, a reluctance to, to call someone else on their behavior because it's, you know, you'd be doing that from your own glass house. So I think that's, I don't know if that was part of your experience, Ken, if that was, you know, kind of the culture in your office. Um, but, but certainly that's something that I see quite a bit of. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, there's almost a, um, an institutional propping up of, uh, of of attorneys, especially ones that are are, are struggling, and, and now that uh, uh, I don't uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with Linda Albert from uh, from our uh, our program in in Wisconsin, but you know she's really uh, reaching out and really saying what a what a disservice that uh, that very thing is to uh, to other uh, legal professionals. Uh, not only are are they uh, affecting individual clients, but really the, um, the, 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 the career choice that they've made and, and the, uh, the, 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 the attorney, um, uh, 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 I just lost the word here. Anyway, they've, uh, they've really done a disservice to, to our profession by, uh, by furthering, um, that, uh, that, that, that kind of behavior. And I, I hope that, and, and what I hope comes out of it, and what I've, what I've tried to do with my story uh, in being very public uh, about this is, is try to reduce the shame um, uh, to the extent that at least I can with my individual story and say, you know, if I can, if I can uh, make it through the, uh, the, the media storm that, uh, that I've did, done and that there's others uh, uh, like me that are willing without judgment to, uh, to help these other professionals and uh, they can reach out in a much, much sooner fashion. They don't have to lose everything before, uh, before they, they seek help from the, the lawyer assistance well, program. Yeah, and that, that's, that's fantastic. We actually, we need a lot more attorneys like yourself coming forward and sharing their stories of recovery uh, to make it easier for others to reach out. And it's a small world because I know, I know Linda quite well. Uh, she was actually one of my co-authors on a study that I just published, that we just published with the American Bar Association um, in February. It was, uh, just came out in the mm -hmm. beginning of February in the Journal of Addiction Medicine. We published a study on the current rates of substance use and other mental health um, challenges in the profession. So I've I've been working closely with Linda over the last couple of years on that project, and she's great. And that's really heartening to hear that you are involved with with WISLAP, with the Wisconsin Lawyers Assistance Program, mm -hmm. because I'm sure not only are you able to get a lot from it yourself, but it's really that giving back and being somebody who's there to share your story. And like I said, help bring other attorneys into the fold because I don't know if you saw saw our study, Ken, but it did. We got a, a fair amount of uh, press coverage with it, and I know uh, Wisconsin Lawyer Magazine actually did a, a pretty right. lengthy. Oh no, I, I, I saw it. It's it. it's, uh, it's fantastic. You know, Linda's done uh, been uh, uh, not shy about uh, about passing on those uh, those results. They're staggering, actually, and and they're really. Uh, if that doesn't open open your eyes or open others in in the, in the profession, then really nothing's going to. Patrick, I'm gonna, with, technically this is weird having the two phone conversations, so I'm going to have to let you go in a minute. But before I do, I want you to do two things. I want you to review the data and tell people where they can go if they want to make contact with you. So what we found on a really global sense is that the legal profession has a lot of challenges. Uh, we're not we're just not doing well in terms of our um, substance use and mental health problems. We found that between 21 and 36 percent of licensed, currently practicing in the legal profession uh, attorneys are problem drinkers. 28 percent are struggling with clinically significant levels of depression. 
19% are struggling with clinically significant levels of anxiety. Um, some of the other major findings were that the two biggest barriers to attorneys seeking help, and again, this really does tie in so much with Ken's story, were a fear of others finding out and general concerns about confidentiality, which is why I'm so glad that he's out there reaching out. It was published in the Journal of Addiction Medicine, um, and it was published open access. You can find it there on the Journal of Addiction Medicine website. Um, and I can be reached through my through my email, which is pkrill at hazeldenbettyford.org. Or if you um, if you just Google Patrick Krill Hazelden, you'll be able to find uh, a lot of my a lot of my stuff there. And we will put up all the links and things on our website too, as well. So Patrick, again, it's a privilege talking to you as always. We'll, uh, we will have a this life podcast up with you and me and Bob Forrest. And uh, I'm going to continue on with Ken, but I'm going to say goodbye to you, Ken, uh, Patrick, and then take a break. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Good to meet you. You betcha. And uh, Ken's going to stay with me. Ken Kratz has got an upcoming book trilogy, Avery, Dassey, and Teresa. We're going to talk about that. We're going to flush out a little more of Ken's story, and we're going to come back right after the break. So I'm here with Ken Kratz. Ken, is there any sort of uh, data you want people to have on you, Twitter handles or anything like that? No, you know, in fact, uh, you may have... Um, uh, been aware that uh, since making a murderer came out, uh, uh, my my Twitter and Facebook and and my website was was really uh, attacked uh, uh, mercilessly. I was uh, threatened. My my life was threatened. Things and and really, unfortunately, and, and if we'd like to talk a little bit about the cyberbullying, I'd I'd be happy to, to to go there. But it really caused me uh, to have to shut all that down and and really don't have the kind of access that uh, that I'd really like to have with not only uh, other uh, attorneys, but uh, just other citizens that have questions. I always uh, prided myself in uh, making myself available uh, to people, even during this whole process. And if they had legitimate questions, you know, I really wanted to, uh, to talk about that. It got to the point, though, that, uh, you know, with the law enforcement involvement and having to... Uh, uh, investigate uh, some very specific, very um, troubling uh, threats, uh, not just to me, but to my staff and, and my family that, wow. uh, that that we had to really uh, take steps uh, to protect myself. And from a, a prosecutor's standpoint from, from 10 years ago, uh, you know, just having participated in that um, that uh, that trial uh, to thereafter be uh, be targeted in such a uh, such a direct and and, and hate filled way, I think is uh, is really a shame. Now these books is it is it three different books? One on Stephen Avery, one on Dassey, and one on Teresa? Or is they are the, well, the the, uh, the 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 one book that uh, that uh, we have um, signed uh, with the uh, with the publisher is. Um, is the the Avery book? Uh, my goal uh, is uh, to um, eventually write uh, three different books. You know the the Dassey case, and I watched uh, I watched your your TV show uh, uh, quite a bit, and especially uh, the the month or so after this thing this thing broke, when it was uh, such an obsessive kind of a, uh, of a topic. The Dassey case is every bit as interesting as, as the Avery case for different, for different reasons, you know, with the false confession and, the, and, uh, and just the manipulation of this, uh, the, this young man, both institutional, that is uh, perceived at least from uh, law enforcement as well as, uh, as his own family, how he was a really... Um, sacrificed, and how his plea offer that he had accepted uh, was really thwarted um, because it was going to make Stephen's case a more difficult uh, case. It's such a, a tragic uh, outcome for uh, you know for that sixteen-year-old uh, uh, to have to. Well, well, I don't um, think we heard about the, that. I don't think we heard the plea bargain. What was that? Well, the, he was uh, given an opportunity to testify. Uh, against uh, against his uncle, uh, and because of his uh, much um, much less involvement, or at least his, his more limited uh, involvement uh, in uh, in these series of crimes, he was uh, provided a, an opportunity to uh, serve as little as fifteen years in uh, in in prison, uh, and he had accepted uh, that uh, that plea bargain, but it wasn't uh, his attorneys who uh, eventually nixed the deal. It was uh, his mother and his grandfather uh, through phone calls um, 
urging him, in fact, uh, directing him not to accept the plea bargain and to uh, make sure that he goes to trial because if he if he did, uh, and and this is this is the real disturbing uh, uh, telephone calls and things uh, was that it was going to hurt Stephen's case, and that uh, uh, you know this uh, this this family uh, lived a, really a, almost a, a cult like um, existence out on uh, out on that uh, savage property with with Stephen being at the the very center of. Uh, of everything that uh, that went on, and so uh, Brendan, um, uh, although uh, being much less uh, involved, uh, unfortunately, and, and as a prosecutor, and at the time I said, unfortunately, uh, he was um, uh, uh, made to uh, uh, choose a path that uh, could only have led to a life imprisonment and. And uh, and that's what he ended up with, and that's just you know it's sad. It's just not it's not part of the story. Certainly, that making a murderer ever told anybody uh, isn't uh, isn't uh, isn't something that you even want to believe uh, a, a mother or a grandfather would engage in. Uh, but uh, but it happened, and of course it'll be um, it'll be part of uh, part of my book and, and part of uh, uh, part of the story as uh, as I finally. I get to uh, to tell the other side and and hopefully uh, be able to um, uh, show the general public uh, the kind of evidence that uh, was presented in this seven week uh, trial and then in the Dassey trial which uh, which followed it up that uh, made this uh, whole uh, planting defense nonsense uh, uh, exactly uh, exactly that and the jury didn't have any uh, any problems with uh, uh, dispelling those. Uh, those suggestions and, and finding both of them guilty. Well, I, you know, I took a lot of grief on social media too for saying that people were believing a television show. They're watching a television show, a documentary with a point of view, mm-hmm. and, and and being a judge and jury based on that. So I think people it would be interested in getting seeing what really happened. My my question, I have a so slightly different question, which is, mm-hmm. it seemed to me the way you laid out what had happened that horrible day. Um, based on the evidence that we saw in the, in the TV series anyway, mm-hmm. didn't quite fit with what I think probably actually happened. A- am I right on that? Is- well, it, 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 it's interesting. Uh, you as, um, I, I assume, maybe, maybe this is a, a wrong assumption, are basing most of that um, on what was... Um, what was spoon fed you? At, yeah, at, yeah, uh, that through, it didn't fit. The, it didn't fit through, for me. Right, this docudrama. Yeah. And they picked, you know, they they picked and and, and choose the fact that that you got to um, that that you got to see, and it wasn't at all uh, what the jury got to see. And I think when when uh, when you realize the 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 editing that went down, when you realize the omission of uh, of evidence. Um, it, it really is is troubling. I think it's irresponsible uh, uh, the way that that was shown, and, and not so much that uh, that a movie was made that way, but that they would call it a documentary, well, uh, that they wouldn't call it show. exactly what it was, some advocacy piece or, yeah. or something like that. Because yeah. because I think the I think the general public, and I think I think uh, legitimately they believe that you know this may not be you know, all of, of the evidence, but at least it's going to be a, a representative sampling of what the jury was shown and, and, and be able to lead to um, kind of a, 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 a good faith conclusion uh, about what had happened. But, but when, you, uh, when, when your design is not to, uh, to tell the real story, but your design is, is advocacy, when your design is, is to lead uh, the audience to a specific conclusion that is that uh, that Mr. Avery was the the, the victim of uh, not only a wrongful conviction but likely uh, a police corruption or, or planted evidence. Then uh, you know then then it leads to this kind of thing. They weren't shy about identifying two um, really uh, really well thought of police officers without any evidence, without any uh, without any kind of um, uh, uh, proof behind it, uh, just choosing them as casting them, if you will, as, as the villains, and then, and then uh, didn't make it 
at all uh, subtle, but uh, that I was uh, kind of the ringleader of, of all that, and in a very real sense, responsible for uh, for uh, perpetrating um, uh, that whole uh, process. And I just, uh, you know, it's it just it, 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 it's amazing to me that uh, that the prosecutor and and, and the cops who um, who who worked to um, to convict uh, uh, what what really, in my opinion, was a, a very dangerous uh, you know psychopath here uh, that you'd hold them accountable for that because the evidence pointed to that, and then how they were uh, really in a in a in a in a very sly way able to kind of turn the tables and to uh, turn uh, Avery into the victim and and uh, and the prosecution in, into the villain. And, you got to remember and, their, the their, their job. job yeah, their that. job. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah their job yeah. was to capture eyes. Done. They did it. That's it. That was their job to get, have success on television. That's it. They don't. They really did not have other priorities. Uh, let me. Let me. Um, two questions I have. One, one is I, I want to give my theory on what he actually did that day, <clears throat> and then I want you to tell me all the previous uh, criminal activities he had been involved with. Because people missed that too. But I I think he probably raped her and threw her in the car, maybe hit her over the head, and then shot her in the car. Isn't that what happened? No, uh, the garage is uh, is and and you know they 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 meaning the making murder kept uh, suggest that there were two different theories that we presented that wasn't true at all. We said all along the murder happened in the garage uh, that uh, Avery uh, did shoot um, Teresa that it uh, uh, shot her in uh, on the garage floor. Uh, by the way. Um, uh, my theory was, you know, I never get to, I never get to, get to give my theory really because it's, 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 uh, uh, it's a situation where I've got to only talk about what the, uh, the evidence and what was found. But my theory was, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a tarp or something that, uh, that this is happening on. And that, that would explain so much of, uh, of the, where it happened, but then there wouldn't be uh, blood on the on the garage floor, and then uh, of course uh, Brendan says they threw her uh, in the back of uh, her own SUV when deciding how to dispose of of her body, and that's real consistent. But yeah. we didn't we didn't really understand until Brendan's statement um, why her own uh, blood would uh, would be back there. But but not you know here's the other thing. Uh, Drew is it's not just uh, not just where there's blood, but where there's not blood, and so there was her blood was on the kind of the side panel of the back cargo area of her SUV, but not on the carpet, and that of course, if you think about it, suggests her being wrapped in something like a tarp or something, so her head uh, is uh, laying uh, bleeding um, kind of uh, against the the side panel, but then there wouldn't be anything left on the on the carpeting itself, and so. Uh, that's my own individual um, theory, and of course, I didn't have to go to that uh, extent. You know, we had the, the forensic anthropologist and, and others that uh, did a, a fantastic job putting uh, the case uh, together with um, with uh, you know the little uh, uh, lead particles and things that we could prove that uh, that she had been. Uh, shot that uh, the manner and cause of of, of death was uh, was exactly what it was. Uh, sometimes, though, you're not going to be able to uh, to uh, uh, answer all the questions or put all the pieces together. It's it's unfortunate, uh, but in a case uh, like this, when uh, you're really starting with uh, not knowing anything. Uh, not knowing where the the the, the murder happened, uh, you know we didn't uh, we didn't find her her bones for the first four days that we had the, uh, the the crime scene. It was only the arson investigator that that walked by uh, the the burn pit that realized that was uh, human material that it was a, a charred bone. Uh, you know, it, cops have been homicide cops have been walking past that uh, for days, uh, and it wasn't a homicide cop at all that noticed it. It was arson investigator. Investigator who had who had been at scenes where uh, where people had burned in in scenes and he knew what it looked like and so it was really happenstance that uh, that uh, 
you know, just an, an arson investigator happened to be there helping because there was uh, such a big crime scene, you know, 38-acre crime scene that, that was being uh, processed. And, and uh, you know, it was fortuitous that an arson investigator happened to walk by and said, uh, uh, hey, guys, we've got, uh, uh, we've got some... Uh, some some uh, some evidence over here that we need to collect, and of course, that really changed the whole scope of the investigation. How come he didn't smash the car up? What do you think about that? Well, well he didn't have the opportunity, really. He, if you if you look at it, uh, it was uh, it was down by the, the car crusher, but this is a active uh, working business and so there are citizens and uh, people that uh, not only work there but people that are are there all day every day so he, and he, somebody, Saturday, would, somebody yeah, would and that was you know it was monday monday uh, late monday afternoon that this happened uh, and uh, saturday uh, you may recall he had uh, gone to a cottage with uh, with his family <laughs> excuse me Sometime. let me just I'm talking too much here. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. He'd gone to this cottage and, and had planned to come back that afternoon. And our theory was, of course, that uh, that would have been the first time uh, that he would be on the property um, um, unabated or with the opportunity to, um, to crush the car. Uh, but uh, it was nothing more... Um, a challenging as far as figuring out that he just um, hadn't been alone on the property and able to, but to do that yet. And finally, what were some of the other crimes he committed or alleged to have committed? Because it was a pretty long list, isn't it? But yeah, the the defense um, uh, allowed uh, during making a murder, Stephen Avery himself or his attorneys to describe his uh, prior history. You know, we had the the burning cat. A situation where Avery uh, simply described it as hanging out with uh, the wrong crowd and and really more uh, hijinks uh, than anything else. He was an adult. Something. He was like twenty four or something. He burned a yeah, burned a cat yeah, alive. What well, wasn't? Well, he soaked the cat in in, in oil and gas and, and threw the cat on, on the fire. And of course, the uh, you know some of the troubling facts that they'll never tell you is is the cat jumped off the fire and kind of ran around on fire and. Avery then picked up the burning cat and put it back on the fire so he could watch it suffer. Yeah. And, and of course, you know what that means. And, and, and I, I know it because I've, I've watched your show and I've watched you talk about that being the precursor to, to many, um, uh, many uh, individuals, uh, both uh, mass murderers and serial killers, and 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 just what you know, what what kind of uh, process uh, uh, mentally they they have that uh, that does that the, the, the sadistic uh, nature, and and that's really how how it, it starts is with animal abuse rather than uh, rather than than through people, but it of course uh, uh, advanced to uh, crimes. Uh, of uh, of violence, uh, pointing you know, firearms uh, at uh, at uh, at others, uh, reckless endangerment, uh, driving them off off the road. But there's also a couple of rapes that he's alleged to have engaged in um, that uh, the uh, uh, the jury never heard about that uh, that we had information um, about with uh, with Mr. Avery. You know, I always say when uh, somebody ends up in a rape lineup, um, it isn't an accident that they've ended up in that lineup. And so uh, you've got to uh, you've got to understand the uh, kind of behaviors that uh, Mr. Avery had uh, engaged in uh, up to that point, and it's a it's a it's a real tragedy that he was uh, wrongfully convicted, and he had such a uh, a, a legitimate claim of, of being wronged, and then to uh, to get out uh, of uh, of prison and and have that lawsuit uh, pending, and and really had a, a very a very real chance at turning his life around, and then to uh, make the choices uh, that he did is. Uh, not only uh, uh, sad, uh, but it had uh, such an impact on on, uh, on so many people, and, and I don't want us to um, you know forget about Teresa Halbach and about her family, and that we're talking about a very uh, real 
a 25 year old with very real dreams and and uh, and and a real family and uh, it shouldn't be just relegated to a footnote in in the Stephen Avery case. This is very much the the Teresa Hallbach uh, homicide and every opportunity I get to to mention that I take it. Yeah, it's a, it was a, a terrible tragedy, and I don't think people. You're right; the, they get so caught up in so many other aspects of it. And uh, like with every one of these killings, where people say it was someone else, well, where where is that guy? And that way, if <laughs> Stephen Harris put away magically, it seemed to take care of everything just magically. Uh, I, there were weird weird stories of him masturbating on hoods of people's cars and stuff. Really bizarre behavior is what I was hearing. It was any of that substantiated? Well, sure. That well, uh, he was convicted. You know. Oh. Of, uh, of, of that very thing that was the motive behind uh, behind the reckless endangerment when he when he drove um, that woman off uh, off the road. Oh. So um, you know, so these aren't just allegations; they're convictions, and and uh, you know that that's very hard to um, um, uh, to ignore. Although uh, they did their best in uh, making a murderer to do just that. Yeah, I, I guess it was. I mean, his his uh, the the IQ of these both these guys made it very difficult. I think, didn't they? Um, yeah, except except let's remember, you know, Avery um, it was very savvy. I mean, this is a guy who who um, was able to uh, to really avoid um, lots of of apprehension for. And, and hiding of evidence and and and, and things like that. Of course, he, he couldn't uh, couldn't sustain that. He couldn't hide everything. He, DNA eventually uh, eventually caught up with him. But I suspect that from you know the 18 years he did spend in prison or or whatever else that uh, uh, that caused him to, to to learn what he did. He did some things very well. You know, doctor, you uh, you may be familiar with. I talk about this cult like existence. Uh, it seemed that the family. Um, kind of propped each other up and and made up for each other's deficits. Does that make sense? So when yeah. so when some of the people you know weren't as as good at some things, uh, they would turn to uh, you know this 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 system, this uh, this family system to, uh, to to survive. And Avery, of course, had um, had his strengths and 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 that was his, uh, his his cunning and you know in at least his own way he's. Uh, uh, he's quite charming. And there, so, there was something about uh, him too that reminded me. It just made me think of fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah. The, just the the cognition, the body habitus, the ears. It just something about it made me. It wasn't a classic, but I thought I wonder if that's what this is. Ultimately, so. But listen, Ken, yeah. I, I've got to wrap this up. This has been fascinating, and I uh, mostly appreciate you being so forthcoming about your own struggles in recovery and your success in recovery. Uh, and as Patrick Krill said earlier. Uh, your willingness to come forward. Uh, there's a lot more people in the public now talking not just about drug addiction, but about sex addiction. I don't know if you saw Ken uh, Terry Crews came out and talked about his porn addiction. And this is people are getting an understanding of how common this is now and how mm -hmm. devastating it can be. It's a common problem, and uh, and it's well, because it's such a it's such a disease of isolation, and that's that's the the very first thing to to allow. You know, in a very real sense, people to come forward without the kind of shaming, you know, that uh, that, that I had gone through, and I understand why that all happened. But uh, if we can, if we can take those uh, those individuals and and at least uh, 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 help them, and at least provide them with the same kinds of of treatment opportunities that we would if it was a drug addiction or an eating disorder or right. or any of those other uh, right. other things that that would go a long and way towards uh, towards uh, towards this thing at least being legitimized uh, well agreed and you know it's it's our sexuality it's deeply sort of uh, tied to our personhood and it's uh, you know, in our puritanical heritage is something that we mm -hmm. all have weird feelings about. So naturally there's a lot of uh, stuff that swirls around it when that's where the disorder develops. But it is exceedingly common. And we have very um, weird, ambivalent attitudes about sexuality in this country. <laughs> and so, and of course, it manifests when people develop uh, addictions around it. But yeah. and, but the drug and, the, drug and uh, the pill thing, it's just so common now. And the attorney issue that's coming finally to the fore, all this stuff is so relevant, so important, and I just am deeply grateful for you being willing to talk about it, Ken. 
but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity, Doctor. Thanks very much. All right. Hopefully, we'll talk again soon sometime. You take care okay. of yourself. Take care. All right, bye. bye. That uh, does it for the Doctor podcast. Hope you all found that very interesting. If you have any questions about it, you can send them in at doctor.com. Maybe I can get Ken back on sometime. We can maybe address emails, questions you have for him. We'll just do a, a thing where we just... Yeah, answer. let's do that. I got a few questions. Yeah. Do you? Like what? Oh, I watched me. I'm making a murderer stuff. Not, not so much about his addiction. But, all right. Uh, all right. We'll get into it. We'll do that maybe next time. But until then...